Hi everybody, it's Mr. Vallejo. Um, today in biology, we're gonna take a look at metabolism. We're gonna take a look at energy and how they're affected by enzymes. Let's go to our PowerPoint for today. All righty. Uh, I wanna remind you that your PowerPoint is available for you in your learning management system, whether that is Schoology or that is uh, Canvas. So let's go ahead and get started. All righty. Uh, just to get your attention and your interest, it says here, cool fires attract mates and meals. Instead of using chemical signals like most other insects, fireflies use light to send signals to potential mates. How many of you have played with fireflies when you're maybe camping or out on a cool summer night? Well, the light comes from a set of chemical reactions that occur in light producing organs at the rear of the insect. But it also attracts males of other species. Females of some species produce a light pattern that attracts males of other species, which are then eaten by the male. How cool is that? All right, we're gonna take a look at uh, these topics uh, that have to do with energy or enzymes or thermodynamics. Uh, we're gonna take a look at all these in preparation for our next talk, which is on cellular respiration. Alrighty, what is energy? Well, energy is the ability to bring about change and to do work. And uh, in my physics class, what I'll often do is just take a, a heavy book and lift it up high and say, hey, I'm not even doing any work as I'm walking around here. Why? Because that book is at a high potential energy. And I'm not doing any work until I drop that book and that that potential energy in the height of the book is converted by gravity, is converted to the energy of motion or kinetic energy. So you can have kinetic energy, that's one of the states of energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion and that potential energy is stored energy. Here's a series of, of photos. Here's this biker, he's biking up a hill, biking up a hill, he's putting out a lot of uh, energy in order to make that movement up the hill. In order to have that movement, he is uh, uh, putting in a lot of energy, but when he gets to the top of the hill, he can rest. And as he rests up high on the top of the hill, he actually has great potential energy. And that potential energy is then converted back to kinetic energy. When he coasts downhill, he doesn't even have to pedal anymore. Well, as we take a look at energy, we know that the, uh, the state of energy, it changes to different forms. And there are many different forms of energy. Well, the sun is the ultimate source of all energy on Earth. And that light energy or that radiant energy, that solar energy, this change of food energy. The second bullet says radiant energy is change of chemical bond energy during photosynthesis. There's some organisms on Earth um, that have, uh, have the ability to trap light, to trap the light energy, uh, because they have chemicals known as pigments, and those pigments can convert the light energy to a different form of energy. In this case, that radiant energy is changed to chemical bond energy. It happens during photosynthesis in plants and some bacteria. Um, there's some protista, uh, the algae, that can do this as well. So that's photosynthesis. We're gonna take a look at that a little bit later in this course. Um, that, uh, that food energy is going to be changed to the energy for life we know as metabolism during a process called cellular respiration. And we're going to study how, how one glucose molecule is going to be converted to 36 ATP molecules. We're on ATP later on in this talk. Anytime you have an energy conversion though, you're going to have some heat lost. Um, a heat is energy loss at all energy conversions. Um, none of these conversions is 100% is, uh, effective. 
And so uh, the conversion from one form to another is going to lose some energy, which we see in the form of heat. Speaking of heat, the study of heat is called thermodynamics. And thermodynamics um, is a, it's a study of energy transformations I wrote here. <clears throat> but really what it is, is that, hang on a second. Um, it, what it is, is, is that you can only see the uh, energy in the, in the form of, uh, of heat. So as we take a look back over here, it says uh, trans uh, thermodynamics is a study of energy transformations. We, it's easiest to, for us to see the, those energy transformations. It's easiest to measure the, those energy transformations by, by measuring heat. And we have a couple of laws of thermodynamics, uh, the, the first and the second law. I took thermodynamics when I was an undergrad at UCLA, woo! And uh, it, was, uh, it was probably one of the hardest undergrad classes I ever took. My girlfriend was taking a, a class uh, that was actually called thermodynamics at the same time um, in the engineering department. My class was thermodynamics, but in chemistry, we call it physical chemistry or PCHEM for short. The American Chemical Society used to put out a bumper sticker that says, honk if you pass PCHEM. I was honking away because I had barely passed that class. Thermodynamics is quite an abstract topic. And uh, for some, including me, it was difficult to, uh, to not comprehend, but to, uh, uh, to uh, learn and to uh, know it in such a way that they can use that. So thermodynamics. Um, the first law of thermodynamics says, according to the first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created or destroyed. And energy can be changed from one form to another, but you don't create or destroy energy, you just change this one from one form to another. So that's the first law. The second law of thermodynamics says that energy transformations increase disorder. This is called, also called entropy. And so the, um, just, uh, the law of entropy says that we go from a highly organized state to a much more simple state. And along the way, you may have chemical reactions and the conversion of, of chemicals from one form to another, eventually to a very simple uh, molecule. But over here, what we see is the, uh, each time you break those covalent bonds, the energy in those covalent bonds are used to change ADP to ATP. ATP is the energy currency molecule that we, uh, we use in our bodies for anything, uh, any movement. Uh, we have uh, in each cell, we have, we have structures called mitochondria as we've already studied. And those mitochondria, what they do is they, they take that, uh, those food molecules like glucose and convert, uh, or use the energy from, from the glucose to uh, make some ATP. So the second law of thermodynamics says that order is increasing. It's a lot like my garage because my garage uh, was neat when I moved in, but right now it's a mess. Now, why is that? Well, because left, when it's left to itself, it just kind of goes to disorder. In order to reverse the process, a huge amount of energy must be expended. Um, guess what I'm doing during the next break? I'm working on the garage to try to get it back to its uh, more organized state. Now, um, just like the earth, my garage is an open system. Stuff goes in, some stuff goes out. Now, hopefully the amount of material that goes in is the same as the amount of material that goes out, because then you can have an equilibrium. Not right now, it's like the more, uh, I have more stuff going in than is leaving. That's like global warming. What's going on is, is you have energy going in and it's taking a little bit more time coming out. So the average temperature of the earth is increasing. Um, that's how climate change is working for us. Someday my garage will look like this, but not today.
All right. Um, another topic that was uh, useful to touch on uh, before we take a look at cellular respiration in another lecture is oxidation reduction. Um, reduction is the gain of an electron. And um, oxidation is the loss of an electron. You take a look at this diagram here. Here's the electrons. Here's, here's a huge molecule, A, that has, uh, uh, it, it, it's out of scale in this, uh, in this diagram. It should be really huge. But there are a couple of electrons here. This molecule A is going to lose these electrons. So we're going to say that molecule A is going to be oxidized because it loses loss, loses those electrons. And where do those electrons go? Well, you have to move over to this guy. This guy over here wants some electrons. We say that because this one is going to gain electrons, uh, we're going to say that molecule B is reduced. So over here, molecule B is reduced, and it goes over here, and it picks up those extra electrons. Now we're going to see that when we study cellular respiration, especially in the molecule NADH. NADH is a high energy electron acceptor, and what it's going to do, it's going to take the electron from this molecule A here, and take those electrons and stick them on there. Now, as it puts those electrons on there, those are high energy, uh, high energy electrons. And so when we get rid of those high energy electrons, those electrons are going to be free to go do something else. And especially the energy associated with those enzymes is going to be able to do something else. Then that NADH is, is going to um, change over to this form, NAD, because what we did was we oxidized that NADH, and now we have the NADA, um, and it goes back and forth, and this is a cycle. If you'll remember from our study on chemistry, this is a reduction and an oxidation cycle. And sometimes we call that, instead of reduction, oxidation, we call those redox reactions. So these are redox reactions, and we're going to see how these actually work when we take a look at cellular respiration. All right, um, activation energy. Um, before we take a look at the classic graph, we're going to take a look at some terms, exergonic and endergonic, which we uh, will be able to see in that classic graph. And then once we take a look at that graph, we'll be able to show you where Gibbs free energy is on those um, enzyme diagrams. So this is the uh, this is endergonic and exergonic. Now, gonic means energy, and ender means inside, exer means outside, like exit. Ender goes inside or under, if you want. Endergonic, endergonic and exergonic. So this is energy going in, and this is energy leaving. So it says your chemical reactions either store or release energy. The energy is, comes in, or it leaves, or it exits. Now, endergonic reactants absorb that energy. Here it is. This is the, these are the reactants before the chemical reaction starts at a particular potential energy. But after the chemical reaction happens, after the energy is inputted, the products at the end of the chemical reaction have a higher potential energy. And so this is a reaction that is storing that energy, not releasing energy. This is, um, this is absorbing that energy, so we say this diagram is of an endergonic reaction. Here's an exergonic reaction. Um, this is the opposite diagram. Here's the reactants at a high uh, potential energy, and energy is released, and these products have much a much lower potential energy. But this is, this represents the amount of energy that was released, the amount that we had in the beginning, minus the amount that we had at the end. This must have been released. So that's energy that's, uh, that's available, energy that's free, energy that can be used for something else. So it says here, release energy and yield products that contain less potential energy than the reactants. This is called an exergonic reaction because it releases energy. Now, um, as I said earlier, when we were taking a look at the term thermodynamics, it's often easiest to study energy by taking a look at heat. So an exergonic reaction is often called an exothermic reaction. Exothermic reaction. Um, really, it's an exergonic reaction. But realistically, because we're studying the heat, it's also called an exothermic reaction. Going back to the endergonic, 
endergonic reactions are sometimes called endothermic reactions because you see heat going in to that system. Now, if you take a look at this classic graph, especially the black line right here first, this black line represents the amount of energy that's required to start a reaction. If you can see here, here's, a, here's a, uh, the reactants and the products. The reactants here have a higher energy, potential energy than the products, just like in this diagram right here, from reactants to products. But it, does, it doesn't just go that way. What happens is you have to put in a certain amount of energy in order to get the difference between here and here. In order to get this free energy, you have to go up this hill, and then finally you get that energy back. The hill is called the activation energy. The activation energy, again, is the energy required to start that chemical reaction. And um, you can see with the red line here, in the presence of an enzyme, what an enzyme does is it lowers the activation energy that's required to stop or start a reaction. So right there, you have the same amount of energy between the reactants and the products that's available, but in the presence of an enzyme, you need less energy to start the chemical reaction. Now to start this chemical reaction you, without an enzyme, you need a lot of energy, but you're gonna get all that energy back. Um, in the presence of an enzyme, you're gonna need less energy and you're gonna get less energy back. But overall, the net gain is that you're gonna gain this energy right here. It's gonna be available for metabolic activities. This is called Gibbs free energy. And because it is um, uh, the difference between the final and the initial, in science, we call that the delta, final minus initial. So we call this value right here, delta G. Delta G is called Gibbs free energy, and it's the amount of energy that is free. It's a net change in energy. It's the energy that is available to do other things. Now, we take a look at that number, and we see that the uh, delta G is negative, like it is in this diagram here. This is going to be an uh, actually, uh, and this is an endergonic reaction because if you take this, there are no numbers here, but if we were to take a number and say this is represents number, this is one unit, this might be two, three, four, five units. Final minus initial is going to be one minus five, which is a negative number. So this diagram represents an extragonic reaction. Now, if these two lines ended up over here, and that would be called an endergonic reaction, it would be above this line, it would be more than the reactants right here. So here you have the reactants. Uh, if the products are above this line, that would be a positive delta G, and those are called endergonic reactions. All right, so enzymes then, are going to be chemicals that lower the activation energy required to start a reaction. We know that they are organic and they are catalysts. A uh, catalyst to a chemist is uh, a chemical that lowers the activation energy required to start a reaction. And then we know the term organic. Organic means that it, is, it comes from a living thing and it's carbon-based. So enzymes speed up the cell's chemical reactions by lowering those energy barriers right here. It lowers it from here to here, lowers the activation energy required to start that reaction. Um, here are a couple of diagrams which you might be able to relate to, or at least give you a different viewpoint of what's happening. Um, in this description, these might be those little Mexican jumping beans, have you ever seen them? You hold them in your hand, it's a bean, and with the warmth of your hand, they start to move a little bit. You open up your hand, and this bean is moving in your hand. What's going on? Well, there's a larvae inside there, and the, your body heat is, uh, is warming up that cold-blooded critter, and it's starting to move. Well, in this diagram right here, what you see is uh, here are the reactants, and these reactants have a certain amount of energy, but most of them don't have enough energy to get over the energy barrier, the activation energy barrier. So what an enzyme does is it squashes that barrier, it crushes that wall, and then these beans are able to jump over the wall. 
we get more of them over here. So that's just the diagram that shows you uh, the activation energy. Here's a guy pushing this boulder. Let's say his arch enemy is down here and he wants to squash his arch enemy with this boulder. Well, in order to get this from here to here, he's got to push this, push the rock, push the rock all the way to the top of the hill and then take one more step and push and then well, then the uh, boulder will come crashing down. But not unless he has enough energy to come down over here and push this up the hill. And that's called the activation energy. Now, specifically, how do, um, how do enzymes work? Well, what enzymes do is, uh, this, is a much smaller chemical called a substrate that fits into just a small part of the protein. Uh, this, uh, uh, protein or the enzyme in this case has uh, a small uh, three-dimensional area that fits this exactly. It's called the active site. You can see it right there. So the substrate fits exactly into the active site. Then something happens and then the, in this case, the chemical reaction is that these two, um, these two monosaccharides that make up uh, sucrose uh, are going to be split up. So that's what happens right there. And then the enzyme is able to be used over and over and over again. Uh, you can recycle it. So the active site has a specific three dimensional shape, and the substrate complements that shape. It fits exactly. So this used to be known as the lock and key hypothesis because it's like a lock and a key. You have the right key and the right shape, it can open the door. And you see in our diagram right there, What's happening is, yeah, it fits. So then the chemical reaction occurs right there. However, if it doesn't fit exactly, then it's not going to work. You can see in this case here, you have uh, something that almost fits in there. But that square peg is not going to fit in that round hole, so there's no chemical reaction. Regardless, what's going to happen is that yellow enzyme underneath, and you're going to be able to use that over and over and over again. So enzymes are very specific, it's like a lock and key, but they found a little bit later that it's actually more like an induced fit. This fits right in there and then it changes the active side, changes ever so slightly to fit it a little bit better. You know, so it's not quite a lock and key, although the lock and key hypothesis was useful early on in helping us visualize what was happening. Realistically, we know that it's that the active side is not just static. It changes a little bit, and it changes for the better, and it fits the subject even better for an increased uh, reaction rate. There are many different factors that can affect the activity of enzymes. If, uh, if you were in my on-ground class, we would do a lab, um, and we would... Uh, we would study the effect of temperature, of pH, and of certain chemicals on, on enzymes. But let's take a look at these ideas and see if we can do a mind lab here. Here's a, here's a graph of what would happen um, if you increase the temperature. If you increase the temperature, what happens is the rate increases also as you increase the temperature. But in humans, what happens is if you get a over 40 degrees, ooh, you've got a fever and you're going to get sick. So why is that bad? Well, here are these, here's a photo of some eggs here. You know, this is called the shell and this is the yolk. Do you remember what this is called? And if you said egg whites, well, I will ask you, why are those clear things called the egg whites? I mean, the shells are white. Why is this called the egg white? Well, after you cook it, that clear material, which is proteinaceous, becomes white. Can you change it back from that white to the clear? And the answer should be no, you can't. And so what happens is those proteins are changed irreversibly. And so because these proteins in your body change at 40 degrees, oh, there's no more enzyme to get that reaction going. And that's why that, uh, that drops, that rate drops at 40 degrees or so, because the proteins, the enzymes that are proteins are going to change their three-dimensional shape and they're no longer gonna be able to work. 
Now here's a here's a bottle of shampoo. You may have heard that your shampoo might be pH balanced. What that means uh, for us is that, that at each that each chemical reaction has a uh, a perfect pH, an optimum pH, a pH where it, where it works the best. Right here, let's say this is the optimum pH uh, for this enzyme. Well, if we were to vary and become more acidic, the rate then goes down. If it becomes more alkaline, the rate goes up. So there's a perfect pH, there's an optimum pH, and then we stray from that. The rate is not as good as it could be. So pH uh, definitely affects how enzymes work. And here is a, this is a, a graph that has to do with the uh, enzymes, uh, the concentration of enzymes. That's how we write that, or the concentration of substrate, because this is true for either one. Um, my analogy for this, if you uh, recognize these guys in this photo, this is Kevin Arnold and Winnie Cooper from the Wonder Years. And that was a mini series. I think it's on Hulu right now. But have you? I love that show because everything that happened to Kevin Arnold in middle school happened to me in middle school. And if, if you went to middle school in the late 70s, early 80s, if there was a school dance, you danced. And that's what we did. And there I am right there. You see me? No, I'm just kidding. I just Googled this. But anyway, um, at a school dance, uh, you've got people, people dancing. And if we can liken it to my high school days, it was like it is. It's like a... The guys were, always seem to be there first, and there's, uh, let's say there are 50 guys sitting in the in the uh, small gym waiting for the dance to go, and we're all hanging out with our backs on the wall, nodding our heads, watching the lights that come from the disco ball, and waiting for the waiting for the chicas to come down. Well, let's say a bus comes, and there's. Uh, there's 30 girls on this bus, and there's 50 guys all together. Um, and then we are assuming a one-to-one a -one dance ratio, one male to one female, back in the 70s, in the early 80s. If that's the case with 30 girls showing up and 50 guys on the wall, my question is, how many of those guys get to dance? And hopefully you said 30, and now it's 30 to 30, and you still got 20 guys on the wall waiting for something to happen. Well, here comes another bus dropping off 20. So now how many guys are dancing? And it looks like it's 50-50 at this point. Let's say a third bus comes with 20 girls on it. How many guys are dancing now? Well, at this point, all the guys are dancing, and it really doesn't matter that more girls are showing up. So that's how this works. It's like this. The rate increases, 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 and then you can add more enzymes. You could add more substrate. You could add more chicas, but it doesn't matter. The rate's going to be the same because all the guys are already dancing. All the guys are occupied. And so this is a, a state uh, where it's called a saturated state where um, every, every, uh, and Every enzyme, every chemical is already working. So if you were to add more of the other chemical, it wouldn't have an effect because uh, all those chemicals are already at work. Now, some chemicals have a secondary active site. It's called allosteric activator. You can see in this series of pictures here, these are activators up here on the top. These are what we call repressors or inhibitors. Let's take a look at the activator. Here you have the primary active site, right here and right here. Here is a secondary active site. And if there is a some kind of change in that secondary active site, that allows the first reaction to happen. The opposite is true for a, recept, uh, a repressor or an inhibitor. If there is a reaction at the secondary active site called the allosteric site, if there's a reaction to the allosteric site, that's going to turn it off. It's called an activator if it increases it, if it turns it on. It's called an inhibitor or repressor if it turns it off. Right. Some chemicals are affected by inhibitors, and so we have 
um, a competitive and non-competitive inhibitor. You can see what's happening right here is here is a competitive inhibitor. And because it's there, it's blocking the chemical from going into the active site. A non-competitive inhibitor is a, it's an allosteric interaction. And that is, an, uh, is the same as a repressor in our previous picture. When this, uh, when this allosteric interaction happens, that turns this whole thing off. You can see that the site, the active site has changed shape a little bit because of this reaction, and that's how it turns it off. <clears throat> Here's another diagram that shows us allosteric inhibitors, um, and you can see that that's going right over there, and it changes the shape of the, of the true active site from that one to that one. Now, some chemicals are affected by other chemicals. Some enzymes are affected by other chemicals. Some enzymes need a cofactor in order to complete the shape of the active site. That's what vitamins do. That's why we say that vitamins uh, don't really give us energy, but vitamins are a necessary part of our diet because these complete the shape of the active site. If they weren't for vitamins, if you don't have those vitamins and the shape of the active site is not correct, and uh, you might have a slight reaction uh, or, or a rate by, that it's uh, metabolized or uh, catalyzed by, by, the, by the enzyme, but the enzyme's gonna work much better if the cofactor is in place. Cofactors can be vitamins, cofactors can be enzymes, but if a cofactor is another protein, we call it a coenzyme. So a coenzyme is a protein that acts as a cofactor. Here's one I take. It's called coenzyme Q10. Um, because I have high cholesterol, I have to take a medication called a statin. And statins are known to lower your concentration of coenzyme Q10 in your blood. So I take some of those as a supplement. Here's a diagram that shows us the catalytic cycle of an enzyme just as a review. And so you can see here the, the active site, the substrate fitting right into the active site, the chemical reaction happening. So that's what's happening in an enzymatic reaction. Um, to finish up, uh, I wanna take a look at the topic of ATP. Um, we'll take a look at the structure and we'll see how it's used to drive reactions that require energy and it is cyclic. So ATP is the, again, called the energy currency molecule and ATP shuttles chemical energy and drives cellular work. It's found just about everywhere in all living things. Um, so we say that it's near universal. Um, and uh, what's happening is, is the uh, bond between the second and the third phosphate bonds are actually high energy bonds. As you can see, it's just gonna be this one right here. It's a high energy bond. When you break that, you're gonna get more energy than you typically would if you were to break a, uh, just a typical covalent bond. It's called ATP because here's the adenine, and then here are the three or triphosphates. So ATP is changed to ADP, DP for two, and this phosphate gets broken off, but that bond, right there, when you break that bond, you're gonna get a lot of energy. So the energy in the ATP molecule lies in the bonds between its phosphate groups. Here's a diagram showing you all kinds of things that ATP can do. Uh, you can have chemical energy, you got mechanical energy, you got uh, uh, mechanical work, chemical work, transport from one side to the other side of a, of a cellular membrane, let's say. So these are things that happen. Now, all of these things that happen are reliant on this ATP. And the way ATP works is it, um, it transfers the energy from ATP to the reaction that requires um, energy. So how do we do that? We do that through a process called phosphorylation. Phosphorylation is when that phosphate group transfers. Over here, you can see it's attached to this triangle here, and then it's not. You can see it's attached to the head of this protein, and then it's not. It's attached to this transport molecule, and then it's not. So when we move a phosphate, um, that's called phosphorylation. When we have extra energy, we, uh, 
we take the ADP and we phosphorylate it and we use for some ATP. When we need energy, then the phosphate group is broken off through hydrolysis and then the chemical energy in that high energy covalent bond is available to be used. So that's ATP and ADP. So hopefully uh, today you've learned some topics uh, that will help you understand cellular respiration. I'm Mr. Vallejo and this is Metabolism, Energy and Enzymes. See you next time.